The 2011-2012 Medical Dental Legal Update continues with Structuring Your Practice, Part 1, Corporate Entities and Buy-Sell Agreements, featuring David B. Mandel, J.D., MBA. Mr. Mandel of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, is an attorney and a principal of the financial consulting firm Odell, Jarvis & Mandel, LLC, where he specializes in risk management, asset protection, and financial planning. He has authored a number of books, including The Doctor's Wealth Protection Guide, endorsed by five state medical societies. Mr. Mandel is a frequent national speaker, and his articles have appeared in more than 100 publications, including over 30 medical specialty journals. You may contact Mr. Mandel with your questions and comments at 877-656-4362 or by email at mandel at ojmgroup.com. I'm David Mandel, one of the principals of the OJM Group. We're a nationwide consulting firm. We've worked with about 1,000 physicians across the country on a lot of the issues we're going to talk about today in this first hour and then in my second hour. Today we're going to cover corporate structure, risk management, tax planning, and asset protection for physicians and medical practices. Before we dig into that, a couple things to, to start off with. First of all, as we see here in my disclaimer page, what I'm going to be speaking to you about are tax ideas, legal structure ideas, benefit planning, et cetera. And while these, this information is very important, you need to also consider that you want to work with a licensed advisor, whether it's our firm or another firm that's local to you. The tax ideas, the legal structures, et cetera, need to be implemented by an advisor who has experience and is licensed to do that. So keep that in mind as we're talking. Now, one of the things we've been doing since the very beginning, while we're happy to be here at AEI, as my, my second talk for the uh, forum, is we're educational based. We, we like to write books, speak at conferences, many medical conferences across the country, et cetera. And we've been writing books for physicians really since 1998. We wrote the first book on these topics called The Doctor's Wealth Protection Guide. Since then, we've been writing books that expand the topics and also do one, doing ones for specific states, like we've done a book specifically for California physicians, Ohio physicians, New York physicians, Georgia physicians, et cetera. And one of the things that we're going to offer as a thank you to AEI, making us part of the program, is a free copy of our latest book for doctors only. Now, if you're in one of the states where we have a specific one for you, we'll send you that one. So one of the things to make sure you do at the end of this hour, or at the end of the second hour, is make sure you take down our information or make a note to contact AEI, because if you let us know, and contact us and I'll give you our contact information at the end of the second hour, that you were here and part of the AEI uh, uh, forum, we certainly will send you a free copy of the book. And if you contact AEI, they will get in touch with us and we'll send you a free copy. So take advantage of that because certainly while I'll be able to cover a lot in the next two hours, it's not like a 300 page book that is divvied up into practice planning, asset protection, tax, retirement, investing, et cetera. It's a lot you can learn from those books. We encourage you to get a free copy. Now today, in the two top, in the two forums, I'm going to do a number of things. First, I'm going to divine, define the environment very quickly here this morning. And then also, we're going to look at ideal corporate structures for medical practices. We're going to look at benefit planning, not only qualified retirement plans, with most, which most of you have, but also non-qualified plans, what are called hybrid plans, uh, very important, fringe benefit plans. Uh, captive insurance arrangements. Captives are something that have become more and more popular for physicians and medical practices over the last 10 years. I see more and more information about that every day. Uh, Buy-sell agreements are something we're going to cover um, uh, here in the first hour, which are extremely important. And also, as we conclude the first hour, why do smart physicians with very good and smart advisors not get the proper advice? How do things fall through the cracks and why do they? And we'll cover that at the end of this hour as well. But first, a little bit of background. 
<clears throat> now, it's very important as you listen to this lecture in the second hour as well, that you consider yourself, you think of yourself for this time as a business person. Now, I know a lot of physicians maybe look down on business people, but certainly it's important because not only are you um, a physician, you're also at least the CEO of your own career. And if you have your own practice, if you're uh, an owner of a practice, you are literally the CEO or CEOs of your practice. And if you want to be as financially efficient as possible, pay the least tax possible, protect assets to the best uh, way uh, available. If you want to get those benefits, put as, what, as much as possible away for retirement and uh, get to retire on your terms, whether that be in terms of timing, in terms of amount of dollars in retirement, you need to think like a business person. So um, the other thing that's really important to realize about that is they're not conflicting. You can be a very good physician and there's other speakers uh, uh, in this uh, seminar series and certainly you do a lot in uh, CME programs, et cetera, to improve yourself as a clinician. And nothing I'm going to say today that I'm gonna cover in the first hour or the second hour is going to affect or impact how good of a clinician you are. Everything we're talking about, you can see patients as often or as little as you want, spend as much time as them as you want. What we're talking about are ways that you can save, protect, and eventually have more wealth uh, given the amount of work you do and how good of a clinician you are. I always ask physicians who come to us in our practice, are the most financially successful physicians in your community, and you can think about this yourself, necessarily the best clinicians? Are they the best doctors? Most physicians, and they come to me saying, well, no, not necessarily. They just happen to be very business-minded or they got lucky or whatever the issue is. They're in the right specialty. So the idea here is you can do well while doing good. Do good. Okay, as uh, you'll hear in this lecture a number of times, I come from a family of physicians. Not only am I advisor to, in our firm, over to 1,000 physicians across the country in every state, but my brother, younger brother's a cardiologist. My father's a radiologist who practiced uh, and still does for 40 years. My grandfather practiced all the way back medicine in the Depression. And so I know a lot of you go into medicine to do good, to help patients in an altruistic way. But the idea of doing well along the way is also important. And that's why we write books, that's why physicians come to us, and they see that you can do well while doing good and it's not a conflict. So I would encourage you, not only today, to get the free book, but to begin to spend time working on your career, on your practice, not just in it. Extremely important. Now a couple of thoughts about the environment we face ourselves here in 2011, 2012. The medical economic environment, I don't have to spend a lot of time on. You know this. You understand healthcare reform is out there, whatever that means. And I don't think any of us know exactly what that's going to turn into. You understand that revenues uh, uh, may decline because reimbursements are constantly being cut and reviewed by the federal government. You understand that expenses are increasing because of technology, uh, EMR, maybe eventually they will reduce costs, but you have to make investments on the way in. And there's inflation and all of that. So if expenses are going up and reimbursements are going down, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you. Let me make a couple of other points on taxes. Maybe you realize this, maybe you don't, but half, nearly half, almost 49% uh, uh, of federal households or households in the U.S. do not pay a federal income tax. Okay? Now, I'm not trying to be political, whether you're conservative or liberal or anything in between. Let's just look at the facts because you, most of our physician clients are in the top two tax brackets. And we can talk about deficits and we can understand where the country's at, but let's look where the taxes are at and then that'll impact where we're going in the next hour or two. So half of the Ameri half American households pay no federal income tax. On the other hand, the largest taxpayers in the country, the multinational corporations, also pay no tax. In fact, if you look at this article that I reference, you'll see that GE, had over $10 billion, in fact, uh, close to $14 billion in income, $5 billion of which came from the U.S. itself, and they paid no federal income tax at all. In fact, if you dig deep into this article, you'll realize that they employ over 800 attorneys, tax attorneys and CPAs in their firm. So when you think of GE, you might think of GE Capital or plane engines or toasters, but in fact, they're one of the largest tax firms in the world, and they're not unique. Almost all the multinationals have a lot of tax advisors on retainer or in-house. 
And so they're constantly trying to pay less tax. And in fact, GE, with $14 billion of, dollars of income, paid no federal tax, actually got a tax refund. So how does that, and what does that mean to you? How does that impact us? The way that impacts us is as high income taxpayers who don't have 500 or 800 advisors uh, trying to advise us on how to pay taxes. Right now we're in a low tax environment and it may, feel not, may not feel like it, but in the second hour we're gonna look at a chart of the federal income taxes for the whole 20th century and you'll see why. So taxes in my view are only gonna be more onerous on those of us in the high tax brackets who are individuals. The multinationals are gonna find ways to not pay tax. Most U.S. households, or close to half, do not pay federal income tax. So there's gonna be a lot of tax pressure on us. So with revenue pressure and reimbursement pressure on physicians, tax pressures on all of us, and expenses uh, going up, being efficient is very important. And over the next hour, and then the next hour, and the next two hours of my lecture, we're gonna talk about ways to relieve some of that pressure, to protect assets, and be more financially efficient. Now let's first jump in and start with corporate structure. Now we see this slide here, it says how to not to structure a practice. Now I'm not picking on just medical practice, it could be any type of business, but I th see physicians really suffering from this problem, which is to have one entity and have it own all of their assets. And the problem with that, just like we learned in second grade, is putting all of your eggs in one basket. So the practice will own typically its most valuable asset, its accounts receivable, it will own its equipment, it may own real estate, and we'll talk about that's typically one piece of advice that physicians get to remove. But certainly the accounts receivable, and what is uh, that uh, subjecting those uh, assets to? Well, any type of claim. Certainly medical malpractice comes to mind because that's probably the largest uh, 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 type of claim and frequency to a medical practice, but certainly also employee claims whether they be employees suing a physician. I've had clients come to us, been sued for sexual harassment or wrongful termination. Um, uh, all of the assets would be subject to that. Uh, certain, also, um, liability because of an employee. So if an employee uh, does something to a patient or gets into a car accident while grabbing lunch for the practice, all of the assets would be, uh, uh, would be subject to those claims. And so, really, that is an, uh, uh, um, a really dangerous way to operate a medical practice, yet in my estimation, dealing with medical practice across the country, at least 80% are structured in that type of uh, corporate structure. One entity, all the different assets. Now what's, what, is, uh, what are your options even inside of that, uh, even inside of that context? You're gonna have one entity, what are your options? Well, your first option is one I hope none of you have, and certainly if you do, you certainly should get some advice on why you may want to change that, is operating either as a partnership or a proprietorship. Okay, this really means having no legal structure to the practice at all. And amazingly, I still do talk to physicians who come to me, and they're operating in their own name as a proprietorship. Uh, every once in a while, I talk to physicians who are truly in a partnership. Now, we may say partner, he's my partner, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, what they really mean typically is he's a shareholder in the corporation. So a partner truly means you're in a, joint, in a venture to, to create a profit without any agreement. Just a general partner. You might even have a general partnership agreement, but it's not a legal structure like something that's filed with the state. Limited partnership, corporation, LLC. The problem with that, if you're in a partnership, you're liable for all the acts and omissions of all the partners. So if one of the partners you have nothing to do with goes out and signs a lease or sexually harasses an employee, your personal assets are on the hook, okay? Terrible place to be uh, um, uh, protection-wise. Proprietorship, same thing. If you, if you operate a practice out of your own name on a Schedule C, all of your personal assets are on the hook for any type of claim. Now certainly you might have medical malpractice insurance, but there are certainly claims that can come outside of that, and there are limits to malpractice insurance too. There's a lot of exclusions and coverage limits. So you'll almost never see an attorney operating at a sole proprietorship or in a general partnership. I've never heard of one. And they understand the law, so you shouldn't either. Also, you're going to pay the maximum in taxes. So why would you choose a structure where you pay the maximum taxes? What I mean here is, as we'll talk about with S-Corps and some of the other entities, you can save a certain amount of Medicare taxes, 2.9%, unlimited. With a proprietorship or general partnership, you can't. So you're gonna pay the maximum 
in Medicare taxes and, as I talked about before, what I call minus five protection, the lowest uh, level of protection because all of your personal assets are on the hook. So a proprietorship and partnership are out there. Some physicians do use them. You shouldn't. Now you've got also LLCs taxed as a disregarded entity. I see this a lot with single owner practices because you can only have one owner and choose to be disregarded. This is where you structure, you use a structure with the state that you, you file, an LLC, but you um, choose for federal tax purposes to be disregarded. So far as the IRS is concerned, you don't exist. You use your social security number. The problem with this is it certainly invites an argument in an asset protection context that since you didn't get a tax ID number, don't file a separate return, it shouldn't be respected as a separate entity if someone's suing the practice. So you leave yourself open to an argument that you're going to be treated like a proprietorship in an asset protection context. Someone's suing the practice, they want to get to your personal assets. I can't point to a particular case where that's been successful yet, but I do think given that there are cases in other contexts where the court has ignored single owner and disregarded entity LLCs, in other cases, not in a medical malpractice case, that that's a very real risk that I would uh, generally recommend clients stay away from by having that LLC not be disregarded, but have its own tax ID number. Yes, it costs an extra whatever, $500,000, whatever the amount is to prepare a tax return. But to me, the cost of doing that is certainly more than worth the protection benefit. Again, the other problem with a disregarded entity is the tax. Again, you're going to be paying the maximum in taxes by using a disregarded entity structure because you have no Medicare tax savings. And again, we're going to talk about the, the S corporation in a second, which gives you that alternative. So you're talking about, again, a structure that may be simpler because you don't need another tax ID number, but allows you to exposure to, uh, from an asset protection point of view, and will make you pay the most in taxes because there's no Medicare tax savings. So again, uh, in our firm, we talk to a lot of clients with their own practice who come to us with a disregarded entity, and part of our process, we've got a couple of CPAs in-house, is to educate them why other options may be better. Now, what is the number one option for medical practices? In my estimation, about 70% of medical practices operate as S-corporations. Many of you listening may have an S-corporation. Why do you use an S-corporation? Well, the one good reason for using an S-corporation from a tax point of view is you're allowed to take your income and spread it between a reasonable uh, salary, reasonable compensation, and the rest is distribution. And that's, that provides a tremendous uh, opportunity to save Medicare taxes because you don't pay Medicare taxes on the distributions. So for example, let's say I had a client who has an income of $400,000, very high income. If they take $200,000 as compensation and $200,000 as distribution, they can um, save the Medicare taxes on the distribution. That would be 2.9%. Again, it's scheduled to go up to 3.8%. So 2.9 times 200,000, almost $6,000, 5,800. So you say, well, that's not a huge number. Certainly important, and if you can do that every year on a 30-year career, that could be hundreds of thousands of additional income, uh, retirement income, uh, uh, as you uh, uh, retire, without doing any more work, without taking away from how good of a physician you are with your uh, patients. The real key is what's a reasonable income for your particular specialty, and there are a lot of ways to, to look at that. What would you, what, what could you hire another physician to see patients that might not have your, all of your years of experience, but the same uh, training? Uh, how much of your time do you spend just seeing patients and on all the other issues? A lot of ways to look at it so you have a reasonable argument of what your reasonable income is and keep that uh, uh, to a certain level and then take the rest as distribution. And that is why most medical practices across the country are S corporations. Now, every once in a while I see an S corporation that acts like a C corporation. What does that mean? It means even though they have that potential benefit of an S, they're paying out everything to the physicians as compensation. So even though they have the opportunity to save Medicare taxes, they're actually uh, paying out everything to the um, uh, docs so that they're paying the Medicare tax on every single dollar. Okay, so what that means is uh, they're acting essentially like a C corporation because what a C corporation does, as we'll talk about, is it does distribute all the income out at the end of the year because you want to avoid a double tax. 
The problem with an S acting as a C, it's like prescribing a medicine to a patient and then them coming back and not opening it. Because you've got the, the structure there to allow for tax savings, and yet you're uh, ignoring that and paying it all out as compensation. And that's unfortunate. And again, we see a fair amount of clients who come to us with, with S corporations. Again, most popular. Most of you in the room probably have it. But they're not taking advantage, not being as efficient as they can be within a reasonable context uh, on the uh, distribution versus salary. Now, again, every once in a while, we see clients who are much too aggressive. I've seen a client with a million dollar income taking 100000 as salary and the rest is distribution. Certainly, they're saving taxes on 900000 on the Medicare side. But I think our firm would say that that's too aggressive. And if they were audited, they probably would have to uh, 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 change that. So again, you have to be what we call in the aggressive end of the middle of the curve. That's what we like to do. In the middle, be conservative, have a strong argument, but also give yourself the best position to save taxes. Now, the last type of uh, uh, structure for medical practice is a C corporation. And I'd say about 15% of medical practices operate as C corporations. Uh, until they change the rules where they allow that re re reasonable uh, salary and distribution play, you saw all the medical practices. If you go back to the 1970s, almost every medical practice was a C corporation. And still about 10 to 15% are. Now, with a C corporation, you have to pay out everything as reasonable compensation because uh, you don't want to leave any dollars in, in the C corporation because then that is also taxed. With an S corp, the corporation doesn't pay any tax. and a C corp, it does. And then you get a dividend and you pay tax on that. So with a C corporation, it's important to zero out the books at the end of the year. You'll hear the accountants talk about that. Why would a medical practice use a C corporation then? The reason is there are certain benefit plans we'll talk about that you can access in a C corporation which you cannot in an S corporation. So while you may not get the S corporation benefit, you may be able to do some things that are even more powerful in a C corporation that you can't in an S. Okay? So um, that's why a lot of uh, medical practices operate as C corporations. Now the good news is you're not committed. You're not committed to any one structure. You can move between an S and a C as long as you haven't done it once in the last five years. And even more importantly, you can use multiple entities. Okay? There's no rule, there's no law, there's no commandment that says a medical practice has to operate in one entity. I always use our example when I'm talking to clients. We have three principals in our firm. We have six different entities. Some tax as partnerships, some tax as C corporations, some tax as S corporations. And net net, we have more benefit planning, pay less taxes because of our multi-entity corporate structure. And you can too. There's no reason your practice has to operate in one entity. For most medical practices, again, for most, individually you have to talk to an advisor, they come to us as an S corporation. So what we're exploring is, is there a way and is there a reason to layer in a C corporation? Typically, if the medical practice is operating as an S, we might suggest a management entity or a marketing entity or a billing and coding entity that is a C corporation. That way you can expose yourself to the tax benefit you're already getting as the S, hopefully you are, and if not, we're gonna review that and make sure you are, and then layer on the C as well so you can take advantage of the benefits of a C corporation. If you come to us as a C, maybe there's, there's a reason to use an S. If you come to us as a disregarded entity or a priorship, maybe there's a re reason to actually convert the main entity into something that's more uh, beneficial. So this slide gives you just a basic uh, uh, diagram, nothing complicated. But if you can use two entities, one as the medical practice entity, one as either management entity, billing, coding, marketing, whatever makes sense for your practice, and that's where, I, again, you have to be diagnosed and you have to be, get the uh, uh, treatment plan based on your specifics, uh, you could take advantage of traditional benefit planning and the reasonable compensation rules on the S Corp and layer in some additional benefit plans that we'll talk about uh, either later in this hour or in the second hour, one particular plan we'll drill down on um, that's only offered to C corporations that uh, uh, can be a tremendous uh, addition to your benefit planning, something I use for myself. So um, keep in mind this structure and ask yourself, is this something you have for yourself? Or have you even looked at it? Okay? That's important um, if you want to get, again, the most financial benefit, the least taxes, the most long-term 
benefit planning out of your practice. Let's talk for a minute about protecting your accounts receivable. As I mentioned before, the one structure, the most common structure for medical practice, one entity, all the assets, the main asset to protect is the accounts receivable. Okay? Now, some of you in states like Florida or Texas have probably heard of ways to pr uh, protect your accounts receivable because those medical st state medical societies have been promoting a way to, pr to protect accounts receivable for the last 10, 15 years. And that's this structure, what I call AR unrelated financing. Essentially, you can sum it up in one word, a mortgage. You get a loan to the practice, use your, your accounts receivable as collateral for that loan, a mortgage, and then do something to protect those loan proceeds. Well, it happens to be in Texas and Florida, there's some very good state exemptions, so people would take that money and put it into annuity, let's say, that's totally protected from lawsuits. The problem with that structure, and a lot of physicians have come to us who put that in place over the years, is not the asset protection part of it. It is true, if you put, get a loan, third party to a bank, and it has a, uh, an, a, a, essentially a mortgage on your receivables, it's gonna be protected against future lawsuits against the practice, that is true. But the problem is they've gotten underwater and they've actually done very poorly and lost money financially because they've been paying interest every year to the bank and sometimes the investments they've had, especially over the last 10 years, might have been flat. So you're paying 7% to the bank over 10, 15 years. You've actually paid out more than your entire principal. And your principal going into that entity may have not grown that much. So we've never really advised clients to do that, but a lot of you may have that in place or have heard about it. It can be done. So we take a look at this slide. You can do this correctly, but you have to have the right expectations. You have to make sure that all the specifics, whether it be the tax rules, section 264, again, very technical, or, uh, uh, but the key is a conservative investment, the proper loan terms, and that really means a fixed loan, um, uh, and having the right expectation that you're gonna try to protect the receivables, but not try to get rich while you're doing it. Because if, you take, because if you're trying to get rich while you're doing it, what are you doing? You're borrowing money and investing it. Well, that's margin, margin loans, right? So you take a lot of risk to, to get over that hurdle rate of the loan interest, because you gotta do better than that, otherwise you're just breaking even, and you take that much risk, you can lose money. And that's what a lot of physicians are, have done. So it's certainly out there. I want you to be educated about it. I want you to recognize it. But probably for most clients, they're uncomfortable taking that kind of loan. Now, something I used to do when I was practicing law a lot is do the same structure but with a related lender, meaning the, it's really the physician's family themselves or a bunch of the physicians getting together would loan the money to the practice and then the practice would put it in something that was protected. Could be a trust, could be an exempt asset, an asset that's protected under your state law. Okay. Um, but the loan now is either the family members or a limited partnership or an LLC that the family members have created. Again, did this mostly in small practices or individual practices, but it certainly can work. In this case, you're not so worried about losing money because you don't have to overcome the interest rate and be aggressive with those loan proceeds because you're paying the interest back to your family members. Okay? So the trust or an LLC that the family members own or the physician, they would uh, uh, loan the money to the practice. So you're paying interest at the end of the day to your family and if you're doing that then you don't care about, um, uh, you don't need to be aggressive with the investments and you can still protect the accounts receivable. So for some of you that might make sense if you're concerned about protecting your AR. One of the firms that came to us was a large OBGYN OB practice with over 80 physicians and 25 million dollars of receivables. They were really concerned about protecting their accounts receivable because any one bad delivery with 80 physicians, and again, uh, the odds are eventually they'll have some bad cases, unfortunately, just by doing that many, any of that can be liable in that one entity structure. Any of those uh, lawsuits would have a good claim to that entire $25 million receivable balance. Even though there are 80 different partners, only one entity. So, uh, they came to us when I was practicing law and wanted to protect their accounts receivable. And we um, actually helped them uh, in a structure that we call AR segregation. This involves not putting the accounts receivable uh, as collateral for a loan, but essentially, think about it. Once you practice, when you practice medicine, you see a patient, that's the practice of medicine. You get paid down the road. In the meantime, there's an accounts receivable sitting there. And you can factor those, you can sell those. You can get a loan against them. 
You can also separate the ownership of the accounts receivable into a separate entity. It doesn't have to be owned by the main medical practice. Okay? And this is very similar, we're going to talk, to in an, talk about in another slide or two, which is about um, how to protect re real estate. Most physicians, most medical practices, from a large group all the way down to a small uh, practice, will get the advice, don't keep the real estate in the same entity as the practice. Separate it and then lease it back. And so most physicians who have uh, a medical uh, building or an office and they own it will have it in a separate entity, typically an LLC, and then lease it back to the practice. So if there's any claim at the practice, it's separated from the LLC. And if there's ever any slip and fall or problem with the uh, 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 property, it's separated from the practice. That's asset protection right there. That's corporate structure right there. Well, you can do the same thing with your accounts receivable. It can be owned by LLCs that are owned by the physicians rather than the practice itself. And the difference with the real estate, the agreement between the two is called a lease, right? You have the LLC owning the property, you have a lease back to the practice. So the next day, the practice can still operate in the same environment. Well, here, you don't have a lease, you have what's called a billing and collection agreement so that if there's no problem, there's no lawsuit, everything stays the same, same account numbers, same Medicare numbers, et cetera. It's only if there is what's called an event of duress, a claim or, important, or a claim of certain uh, 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 dollar amount, whatever you define it as with your lawyer, as long as you do that, if things, you never have a problem, then the accounts receivable, everything moves just as it is today. Same accounts, same uh, uh, billing numbers, all the same thing. It just works as a safety valve that if there is that terrible judgment against the practice, then the accounts receivable are separated and need to be collected separate and the, the person who has that judgment against the practice will not have access to those accounts receivable. So that's a solution, for example, that uh, the law firm I used to work with specializes in. And when we have a client who's interested, and you may be interested, we just refer them out to that law firm. It's, it's uh, probably, probably the best law firm in the country for doing that type of transaction. So for a lot of physicians who come to us who want to protect their accounts receivable um, and don't want to get a loan, that's a very good uh, thing to know about because it's not something that a lot of the medical societies are promoting, but a lot of physicians that have uh, worked with us or talked to us over the years have put that in place and they feel very comfortable that their accounts receivable are better protected than if they're sitting in the practice, but they're also um, not subject to a loan. Okay? Now I mentioned in talking about accounts receivable, that's very similar to real estate. So we don't have to spend much time on that. Again, most physicians get the advice that if you're gonna have a piece of real estate in the practice, keep it separate. And that's what this, this diagram uh, uh, really uh, uh, shows, which is you have the practice, you have the LLC, typically a limited liability company, is the best entity for owning real estate. You have the LLC owning the real estate and you have a lease back, what we call lease back, back to the practice. So as long as the lease could be a triple net or quadruple net lease, so the next day, the ownership's in the LLC, but the taxes, the maintenance, and all that can still be paid by the practice. But as long as there's no problem, everything works perfectly. There has to be a little loan terms. There has to be a little lease agreement. You have to respect the formalities. But as long as there's no lawsuit problem, everything works perfectly. And if there is a lawsuit problem for the practice, the real estate's separated. And if there's a lawsuit issue with the, with the uh, uh, real estate, then the practice is separated. So if you don't have that in place and you do have real estate, either owned in the practice I've seen, still exists. I've seen physicians, talk to one last week, who owned the real estate, they separated it, but they own it in their names personally. I said, well, at least you've separated from the practice, but the fact that you own it personally, that's no good. Claims against you, subject to, uh, uh, to get to the real estate. Um, uh, there's no tax benefit there. Uh, so having that real estate in an LLC is the next step. And many of you probably have that. And if you do, make sure the formalities are being followed. So to conclude on the corporate structure, you've got to ask yourself some questions because that's really the key. How does this work for you specifically? Do you know why, why you employ your present corporate structure? Whether it's one entity, whether it's an S corporation, whether it's a C corporation, whether it's a disregarded entity, understand why you have that. And if you don't, ask, start to ask the questions. Two, if you'd like to save taxes and be more financially efficient for 2011, 2012, and going forward, while protecting your asset, does it make sense, if you don't already have it, to look into a, a dual corporate structure, okay? Um, that's, that's important. 
And then also, if you're interested in protecting any of the other corporate assets, whether it be the accounts receivable, which is probably the leading one, real estate is probably the second leading one, have you done what's needed to protect those accounts receivable, to protect that real estate? Have you looked at the options? So ask yourself those questions because there's really some opportunity for a lot of clients to protect the assets and better position themselves for taxes. So I want to spend a few minutes, as we conclude the first hour of this talk, on buy-sell arrangements, then a bit about why physicians who have good advisors, smart advisors, don't get the right advice. So first, let's talk a little bit about buy-sell agreements. I've done an article, and I think there's a chapter in one of the books that's titled, in fact, The One Contract a Medical Practice Must Have. That's how important I think buy-sell agreements are for a closely held medical practice. Let me tell you a story, true story. We've got a client, uh, about six uh, physicians uh, in the Midwest, and very successful uh, surgical practice. And within a span of six months, one of the physicians, unfortunately, had a heart attack and passed away, and another became disabled and could no longer perform surgery. So in addition to having friends and colleagues uh, uh, literally pass away and be sick, and the emotional strain that took on uh, for the existing physicians and the ones that remained in practice. But they also had significant financial issues that are still being resolved. Meaning, what does the spouse of the physician who passed away get? They get nothing? What was, what was uh, in their uh, partnership agreement? Unfortunately, um, in this case, there wasn't much. Uh, same with the physician who could still practice by seeing patients but couldn't perform surgery anymore. The four who were remaining not only had to pick up the work of the two, not only were emotionally stressed because of personally what they were going through, also having to try to find and recruit other physicians to their town to, uh, uh, um, they were thinking about expanding the practice, but now just to, to uh, keep uh, afloat, to keep uh, above water. Then all of these issues come up. What is the moral obligation, if any, to the family of the physician who passed away? What about the uh, physician who's disabled that can practice but can't perform surgery? How should they be compensated? All of these issues get extremely difficult when you're in the moment because there's a lot of emotions going on on both sides. The family that's now losing their breadwinner and they're looking for something. The, the existing physicians who want to do the right thing but can't come out of pocket uh, uh, significantly to do much about it. And all of that can be taken uh, um, taken care of with minimal aggravation that protects not only the physician who eventually does pass away or gets sick, but also the physicians who survive. Because when you put something in place, and let's say that these clients had a buy-sell agreement, and we'll talk about what exactly that entails, but if they had that in place before there was a problem, years ago, nobody knows. It could be me of the partners who gets uh, uh, sick or, or who passes away early, or it could be the other a partner. So there's no animosity in negotiating and putting together the plan because you don't know who it's going to benefit. And really, the, the, the big picture benefits both sides because you don't deal with these difficult issues in the middle of uh, um, uh, dealing with the loss of a, uh, a physician either for death or disability. So if you can put this kind of agreement in place before there's a problem, not only will the physician who passes away or gets disabled be better off in their family, but so will the practice. The practice will survive it much easier. It's already in place. There's no disagreement. Everybody knows what to do. So what does a properly funded buy-sell agreement, what does it mean and what do you need to have in, in place there? Well, the first thing that's important is you need to have some kind of value put in place. And that might mean you go out and get a real valuation, or it can be more informal, a ballpark figure. Again, as long as it's reasonable and everybody agrees, you can use that as the amount. Because really, what you want to also avoid too, and which I neglected to uh, mention before, is when that physician passes away, in some states, that ownership can be owned by the family. So now you've got another partner there. And especially if you're in a practice that has real estate, that has surgery center interests or other types of ownership that's not just the practice of medicine, certainly those can be owned by existing family members. So another problem with not having the buy-sell in place is you may be stuck with some new partners you don't want. You don't want your physician's spouse to be your partner and their, fam and their, and their children. 
So if you can have this in place, not only can you avoid uh, acrimony and uh, litigation, but you can also have, a, 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 with the right value, a position where you have the dollars to buy them out so you keep the ownership with the existing remaining physicians. Extremely important. Again, we have this for ourselves in our own practice. So you got to have the value. Triggering events are very important. A lot of people think of buy-sell just for death, okay? If he passes away, what happens? But I think for physicians, disability is as important as death because, again, like the surgical uh, practice, the physician can, is still alive and healthy enough to see patients, and, but he can't perform surgery. So for them, for the, the uh, generation of revenue and all of their compensation formulas, it's just as important because if, they, if he can't uh, see patients and actually perform the procedures, he's not doing, he's not, you know, carrying the load of the other surgeons, and so certainly he shouldn't be paid the same way, but how should he be paid and, and, and how does that work? Those things need to be worked out in advance in the buy-sell agreement, okay? Funding is absolutely crucial. And what I mean by funding is you have to have the right insurance policies to protect against that risk. Because if you have an agreement in place, it says, oh, this is what the value is and this is what the triggering events are, but you don't have the, the, the policies that are right in place to uh, uh, cover those risks, then you've just, you've, you've solved one problem, which is defining what the values are and what the roles are, but you got to come out of pocket, not maybe millions of dollars. So um, having the agreement without the funding, and we see clients who come to us, physicians who've, you know, gotten the, f the agreement together, but they never got around to getting the insurance policies together. That is like a trust without an insurance policy. That's like, a, 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 you know, taking the medicine, but not taking the right amount or taking one of two medicines. It doesn't work. And so um, for, disability for disability, obviously, the, 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 the mechanism for uh, transferring that risk to an insurance company is what's called a disability uh, income policy. And that way, the company can be paid or that uh, a physician can be paid, and that money can be used to offset their lower income that's defined by the buy-sell because they can't do the same treatments anymore. And so either way you do it, and there are a bunch of different options, the funding is there to either cover the practice or make up for the shortfall for the physician. And everything is defined in the agreement. On death, obviously, the uh, right uh, uh, insurance there is, in, uh, is life insurance. Now, again, uh, we don't have the time today, but there's different types of insurance. Term insurance, which covers for a certain period. Cash value insurance, permanent insurance, which can cover all the way um, to age 100 and beyond. Typically, t term insurance is very inexpensive and can do the, do the job absolutely fine. And so, uh, because you're trying to define, you know, trying to cover over a certain period, that could be 10 years, 20 years, et cetera. At that point, the physician is probably phasing down their work anyway. And again, this is why it's so important. I can give you the general rules today, but to sit down with advisors, whether it's our firm or any other firm that specializes in this for physicians and make sure that the agreement is in place and the uh, insurances match the agreement. They have to work in uh, 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 coordination. That's why the team is so important. Obviously, you need an attorney. Okay? When I was practicing law, this is one of the things we used to do. Um, and you need someone local uh, who's you know, licensed in your jurisdiction to put those by cells. And if it's something, you're working with someone who's experienced, this shouldn't be very difficult. They should have some pretty good models of perhaps even what other medical practices have put in place. And then you need the insurance advisor. And the key is you need coordination. I can't tell you how many times clients come to us and they might have had a good attorney or they had a, a sharp insurance person, but there was no coordination. And again, if the practice is important to you, if protecting your family is important to you against these risks, then taking the time out of your busy practice and sitting down and saying, listen, we need to have a buy-sell in place. And it's not fun, no one wants to think about uh, becoming disabled or dying. Uh, you're not, you're not going to make any money on this. You're not going to save taxes like some of the things we talked about and that we will in the second hour. Um, but it's something that I think you really need to think about to protect the practice going forward and the headaches that can happen if you don't and your family. So really, you know, make a note of that and make sure you have that in place. And the other thing is that even if you have a buy-sell agreement in place, it's good to review it every three to five years because of the value issue. Okay? You, you might have had a practice that was valued at X, especially if it has real estate and, again, another LLC or surgery center interest, et cetera. You know, five years ago, now it's in 2X, we hope, or 1.5X or some, you know, multiple 
of that. And if you've still got the numbers in there and the insurance coverages to match those numbers at the lower value, then if something happens, you're inadequately there. You're better than not, not having anything, but you know, perhaps that family is going to want more and there's going to be some uh, acrimony and perhaps even litigation there. Uh, so especially if you, have, if you have in place, but you haven't reviewed it in a while, or certainly if you don't have a buy-sell agreement in place, put this on the list to bring up with your partners this year and get it in place. Now this leads me to the last topic we're going to cover in the first hour, which is why do doctors with smart advisors who are savvy themselves get poor advice. And um, I see this all the time. I mean, if you think of our firm works with physicians across the country. We've been working with physicians I have for 17 years. And people who read our book, we've so, you know, 20,000 of our books are out there. And again, you have the offer through AEI to get a free copy of it. And almost every physician who reads our book, unless they're just coming out of training, you know, already has a CPA, so or someone's doing their taxes. Uh, they might have an attorney that they'd use to create their legal entity, their corporate structure, or maybe a will or something like this. Um, they maybe have some insurance. They probably do if they have uh, disability insurance or life insurance. They may have an investment advisor. Um, and so why are physicians who have these types of advisors coming to us reading the book saying, I never heard of that before. No one's explained to me the corporate structure and, and some of these issues before. And the number one reason is coordination. I can't tell you how many times people come to us and they can tell me, and I'll ask the question out there to the audience, how many times has your attorney who advised you either on the wills, trusts, or the corporate structure sat in a room with your CPA who does your tax returns and maybe does your financial uh, uh, preparation, uh, who sits down with your benefit plan expert, okay, who's a qualified plan expert who understands your 401k or profit sharing plan, et cetera who's also in the room with your insurance advisor, who advised you perhaps on life insurance and disability insurance, or maybe another insurance advisor as well, uh, who advised you on uh, umbrella policy or homeowners or car insurance. And how many of them have sat down all together with your investment advisor, uh, who is managing your money, uh, who may just understand the markets and investment? And maybe even have a financial planner on top of that, someone who's really looking at college education funding and financial projections. How often, has that happened? For most physicians, it's never. And I'm not picking on physicians here because for most uh, sophisticated business owners, we have business owners with 50, $100 million revenue companies or work tens of millions of dollars. And that coordination never happens with them. One of the things we try to do in our firm is build a firm where, I don't like to use the word one-stop shop, but where you can have all of that where you have attorneys, and you have CPAs, and you have qualified plan experts, and you have uh, uh, non-qualified plan experts, and CFPs, and our whole money management division that has PhDs, et cetera, et cetera, portfolio managers, and have it all under one roof. Some of our clients you know, come to us and they've worked at the Cleveland Clinic or the Mayo Clinic, and they say, this is kind of like what the executives, the CEOs who come in for their executive checkup get. They get all these subspecialists working them up, making the diagnosis, but it's all under one roof. And that's the way the care uh, uh, gets to the highest level. So if you don't have that, how can you expect, if you're not having that coordination, even if you have the right, um, uh, you have smart advisors, they can't come up with the ideal solution for you. And as we bridge the uh, first hour to the second hour, think about what I was talking about before with the choice of legal entity. Most medical practices are S corporations. Yet, as we'll talk about in the second hour, there are benefit plans, and we'll drill down to one benefit plan that's extremely valuable. I take advantage of it for myself that many of you may want to use, but it's only available to C corporations. So, when I was practicing law, I was advising clients oh, you should be an S corp, you should be a C corp, setting up those entities. But I didn't know a thing about benefit plans. It's not on the bar exam. I went to one of the top law schools in the country, UCLA, they don't teach it there. And so you can go to one of the largest law firms in your city, and probably they don't have any lawyer that really understands benefit plans. They may have an ERISA attorney that knows qualified plans, but they certainly aren't going to be very knowledgeable on non-qualified and, and uh, uh, fringe benefit plans. And certainly the attorneys that are working with small medical practices aren't, and you can't expect them to be. So the point is that if you drill down just to one that one example, and you're going to make a decision if you're going to be an S-corp or a C-corporation, you can't really make that decision 
unless you also know the benefit plans that an S corporation and a C corporation offer. So as a scientist, as a medicine, practicing medicine, how can you make the ultimate decision on what the best plan is for you unless you know all of the options within that plan? Most, medic most physicians just become an S-corp because it's what the accountant told them to do. But they haven't looked at all the benefit plans, so they can't work backwards to decide what's the best structure and then implement it that way. So we talked about corporate structure in the first hour, but as we go to the second hour, and we start to talk about benefit plans, you'll start to see these things come together because you may decide, hey, that's a benefit plan that I want to look into, but I can only use it if I have a C corporation. That leads me to a discussion on my corporate structure. Maybe I should think about a dual corporate structure and a C corporation. So even if you have the uh, expertise in one area, unless you're coordinating it from a number of areas, then oftentimes the best ideas aren't floating to the top. So if coordination is the leading problem we see with uh, physicians and their existing advisors, I would say not understanding specialization is the second. In medicine, you are trained to understand your specialty and essentially stay within that, and even a subspecialty. So my brother, who's a cardiologist, if someone comes in and complains about a skin issue, he is certainly not going to try to diagnose a skin issue. He's going to refer that to a dermatologist, and a dermatologist who is seeing a patient who started to uh, complain about some chest issues, it's going to refer them to cardiologists, pulmonologists, etc. Medicine, very specific board certified specializations, and you're very good at that. In our area, the area of finance, the area of law, the area of tax, people really don't understand specializations. I mean, if you think about it, the U.S. tax code, for example, and all of its revenue rulings and revenue procedures and private letter rulings and daily announcements and tax memorandum and tax court cases, et cetera, et cetera. It's the most complicated set of rules created by humankind, okay? Yet, we expect our CPA to know everything about everything there is to do with taxes. Even though, as we already heard about, uh, some multinationals have hundreds and hundreds of tax advisors inside of their firm. And the largest law firms are hundreds and hundreds of uh, attorneys in there, and same with CPA firms. So you have to understand what your advisors are specialists in. The same thing with finance, same thing with insurance, and all the different areas that you might get advice on. And that's why in our firm we have so many multi-specialty people in our firm. I don't need to know about taxes that much, even though I have a background in tax, because we've got a number of CPAs in there. Same thing with finance, same thing with particular insurance areas, qualified retirement plans, non-qualified benefit plans. Every one of these areas requires specialization, and you really got to know your stuff, and you got to keep in, in, in informed on what's going on in your specialty. There's no way you can be experts on multi-specialties. So the final thing to consider when about your existing advisors and the things we see is not getting a second opinion. Again, it seems so, it, it seems so uh, um, obvious, but I'll tell you a true story as we wrap up here. When I was at a, the law firm in New York City, the first summer I was there, we had one of our largest clients, multi-million or $100 million client, who decided for some uh, reasons that he thought he might get audited and, and was concerned about what was going on in his different multiple companies. And so the attorney in our firm actually, with my help, oversaw an audit of all of their CPA firms. They had a number of different ones, including some that were as large as 500 CPAs. Because they were concerned about, what if we get audited? And we looked back a number of years. And what the attorney on t uh, uh, leading that found was that a client, by doing some different depreciation deductions and some different characterizations of their uh, partnerships, they had about 50 or 60 different entities, would, it, would it be able to file for a multi-million dollar refund? So not only were they sitting on perhaps a problem with a tax audit, but they actually could, ref to, could uh, restate their returns and get dollars back from the government. Well, needless to say, that client was very happy. And it took that client years and years, and just because of you know, one reason, to spend the money, in that case, hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees, to oversee that audit. How many of us have done that? How many of us have had someone else take a look at our, second look at our investing, or our tax returns, or our legal structures, or our corporate structure, or our benefit plans? And if you haven't, how can you know? Uh, this client who's, you know, seemingly in, you know, New York City metro area worth hundreds of millions of dollars was sitting on that kind of opportunity I'm not saying you'll have that same type of uh, uh, result, but certainly the idea of getting a second opinion, very few have, it's certainly important. You do it if it was a serious medical condition, and certainly your wealth care is as important as your health care. And that's why I think a lot of you are uh, paying attention and why this is important. So as we wrap for the full hour, um, 
a covered corporate structure, how to protect assets, the different options not only from an asset protection point of view, but how to be more tax efficient. And recall that in the tax decision, some of the decision of how your practice should be structured is going to be tied to what we talk about in the second hour, which is what are the benefit plans that are out there? How can you put more away on a tax uh, uh, favored basis from your practice so you can build more for yourself and be more financially efficient? We'll be covering that and some other topics in the second hour. That concludes another in a continuing series of programs on medical malpractice, risk management, healthcare law, practice management, and selected clinical topics. Presenting was attorney David B. Mandel.